blogger, E-E-V, blogger. Hi, welcome to Electronics, Australia's biggest electronics exhibition. Once again, here in Melbourne, it alternates between Sydney and Melbourne uh, each year. We're back here at the Melbourne uh, Function Centre at the Melbourne uh, Rod Laver Arena Tennis Centre here. So, let's go check it out. An organism that thrives on caffeine and last minute work. Show us the front. Uh, we do. Here we go, trust me, I'm an engineer. That's gold. <laughs> Winning t-shirt, well done. And you can't beat beaver merch. Look at that. Oh, stress beaver. Love it. Better than a free pen. Having a look at some optical porn here. Leica, of course, one of the best in the business. And uh, this is uh, not a cheap microscope. It's actually got an inline uh, camera, and that looks like it can, can record video as well. 25 frames per second, straight to SD card. But uh, it doesn't. It's not a. Uh, this one's not a particularly high magnification one. It's well. It depends on your, of course, your uh, eyepiece and your uh, uh, main optics down the bottom. This I really like. This plate here, so you can move your object around. You probably can't see it, but I'm subtly moving that. It's got a viscous uh, liquid in it, so it really gives you fine movement. There's a lot of resistance in that, and that is a really nice plate for really fine movement. That's fantastic. So here's a brand you probably haven't heard of. This is the Mix C, and I've actually got one of these in the post, I believe. This is the MT. Uh, 310T. I can't remember the model uh, numbers, but there's one that's about four and a half grand. It's actually very pricey, right up there with the Agilent uh, handhelds and those sorts of things. But they've actually got a cheaper one which they're uh, sending me. I said the other one was too expensive and people would probably freak a bit. So I think they're sending me one that's worth about 1400 uh, bucks or thereabouts, which is pretty good. Um, isolated uh, inputs, as well, of, of course, um, so dual channel isolated uh, inputs. So that's the big thing with the handheld meter. They're not only isolated from mains earth because it's battery, but isolated from each other. And um, those probes actually look, there we go. That looks quite decent. Don't mind that at all. And uh, you can tell it's isolated. It's got the shroud all the way down, so you can't physically get in there and uh, contact any of the metal in there. So very safe. But uh, yeah, Mixig, um, this is a high performance. The $4,000 one has like 120,000 waveform updates per second or something phenomenal. I think the $1,400 one, don't quote me on any of this, but it's like, you know, 30, 40,000 waveform updates per second. Really actually quite quick. So you can do a scope and a meter and a recorder. And uh, I don't know, we're in scope mode, obviously. And there's our trigger level. That's actually fairly easy to adjust. They've got a reasonable velocity control on that though you hold it down and that's actually not too shabby don't mind that at all but yeah the thing with the um, handheld scopes are all the same they've all got you know there's no knobs on them you've all got like your time bases you know like that this is a captured waveform so there we go I think it's got uh, is that no SD 240k is that uh, means it's got 240k of sample memory I'm not entirely sure anyway um, yeah, fascinating the mix sigs. They're um, quite high performance beasts. We can go into the can we go into the meter? There we go. That's a massive, massive display. Unbelievable. Not sure about the uh, update and all that. Touch screen, we can do capacitance. Jeez, resolution's not terrific on that. Just a regular uh, three and a half digit job by the looks of it. And yeah. I don't know, just make it a scope. Geez, you don't need a multimeter built in. Anyway, and a data logger and everything else. So it looks like it's got a chart recorder. That's uh, their definition of a data logger. And our scope, of course, which we've killed our signal. It was on there. Well, let's see if we can get some updating on this puppy. There we go, there we go. Boom. That's what we're picking up before, just a 50 hertz. So that's actually pretty pretty quick updating but yeah that's a nice little handheld well it's not little it is absolutely massive you can see compared to the size of my hand this is uh, quite a big unit look at the tilting bale on that it's absolutely enormous anyway 
um, Shenzhen Mixig Instrument Co. They're um, up and well, they're trying to be an up and coming uh, instrument company, but they're certainly um, not bottom of the range specs. Uh, they, you know, they throw everything, including the kitchen sink, in here. Really good uh, performance. This one's a 100 megahertz uh, bandwidth, one gig sample uh, per second. It's got a couple of mega sample memory or something like that, and. Uh, Cat 3, 600 volts, so that's not too shabby for the uh, meter stuff. And Cat 3, 300 volts for the scope inputs. So there you go, hopefully I'll be able to do a uh, review and tear down of this puppy soon. I believe it's on the truck somewhere. We've got this Ursa scope here, you can see this is actually a, uh, it looks like a soldering iron, but it's not. It's a visual, uh, inspection system for BGA parts. You can see they'd have little uh, fibre optic cameras with uh, right angle mirrors on it and if we, it's a very funky looking unit, if we go over here that's what we're seeing. We're seeing under the BGA there, you can see the balls and uh, that's really, what, if you need something like that you need it but unfortunately uh, getting into the uh, centre balls of course you can't that's when you need the um, x-ray inspection systems but uh, if you can see a direct line straight through the BGAs then you know there's no shorts and if you look on all four sides you can actually see a clear path and you can at least see there's no uh, shorts in there but to yeah get to the inner balls but as you can see we can see some of the other balls in there so you can get some detail on that ah there we go and we're going to adjust yep there we go adjust our depth of field and focus, yeah, we can focus on the far balls. There we go. There we go. So we just tweak the ring on that. Bob's your uncle. So there's our little uh, USB, USB cam, cam right on there. the top. And yeah. uh, we've got a coaxial light source coming in. So yeah, that actually... The same light system, yep. Yeah. And so then we've got our mirror. So that's the, that's the camera a, straight that's down. A prism, though, no, no, yep. Man, that's there, there's, a, there's a prism at the end. And we've got a... Uh, Another light source, a backlight source on this side, so that is a really nice system. Take a quick squiz at this Vices brand. Haven't seen them before, but the working distance is ridiculous. Look at the absolute huge amount of working distance, and check this out. That's got to be. That's equivalent. That's probably equivalent to the Tagano 40 times. And it's full HD, how many frames per second? Well, there we go. Getting a bit of shimmer on there. Zoom. Yeah, it's got a 20 times zoom. 12 times digital. Tw uh, 12 times digital, okay, so we're into digital, yeah, that's what, right. I, yeah, right, so I didn't see the transition. Ah, there we go, I think it transitioned right there into digital zoom. So okay. 1080. Yep, 1080p. 60 frames per second as well, yeah. so yeah, equivalent to Tagano and the price. Tell us the price. Four and a half thousand, very equivalent to the Tagato. Built-in frame go. grabber. Ah, a but it's got a built-in frame grabber, hence why the big it. bulge. Okay, yeah. right. So you got yep. HDMI cable into your monitor. Oh, okay, you right. Software, yep, yep. So you can hook it up to your PC. Got it. And do you have a crosshair so you can do measurements? Yep. Send images and so on. Nice. And where's that made? Sweden. Swedish. There you go. Hi to all my Swedish viewers. <laughs> And they're giving away Rubik's Cubes at the National Instruments stand, and they're crap quality, you're saying? Yeah, they are. And if we go to the Vicom stand here, we're going to see some high-end hardware. This here, this puppy, look at this. That is 70 gig analog bandwidth, folks. 200 gig samples per second. And uh, if you want to know the price, you cannot afford it. That's the ATI High Performance Scope and... Yeah, it's ridiculous. You don't get your uh, just your regular uh, passive probes on this puppy. It's a serious business for uh, serious performance measurements. And coupled here with this arbitrary waveform generator, what's the bandwidth of that? And on that, if you're wondering, well, where's the knobs, Dave? Well, knobs are actually up here. Look at this. They've got an auxiliary, auxiliary front panel. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Unbelievable. So there's your four channels. There you go. Oh, terrific stuff. <laughs> it's just, it's it's not the same, is it? It's not the same. I'm sorry. And another one in the category, if you have to ask the price, you can't afford it. This is the Keithley uh, Semiconductor Characterization System. And there we go. They're testing the uh, characteristic 
curves of an N-channel MOSFET there. So, and these are all, uh, of course, you've got to buy all the extra uh, uh, remote uh, pods and things like that. But it's basically a uh, industrial uh, PC with basically, um, you know, high-end multimeter plug-in cards, pretty much the equivalent to um, the 2640 uh, uh, source meter here. Very nice source meter, by the way. One of the best. And uh, basically, it's just got a whole bunch of uh, high-end source meters in there, and you attach into the pods, and you can do your semiconductor characterization. Very nice, but you're probably not going to get any any change out of uh, $50,000 for that, I suspect. And I'm here with Chris Kulik from Fine Mark Design, and he's going to—he's a professional PCB designer. And he's going to tell us the perils and pitfalls of PCB <laughs> designing PCBs. What do you got here, Chris? Oh, we've got a uh, 12 layer board with fine uh, pitch BGAs with a DDR3 memory, as we see here. Yep. And this has got a quad video interface, and it's uh, designed for a uh, safety equipment on a uh, mining trucks and the likes. Ah, got it, right. So the video camera's there to give the driver a view uh, right around the perimeter yep. of the truck. And as you can imagine, those trucks are very large, yep. big monsters, and they're and it's got tilt sensor connectors and sensors the tilt of the truck mm -hmm. to make sure that it doesn't uh, roll over on that. Got it. Uh, this was designed about a year and a half ago, and see, so we've got Bluetooth, uh, so they've got some remote communication happening. Right. And, and you're the layout guy. You do just layout for a living, not even the schematics. You actually get customers give you the schematics. Yeah, the customers riddle with their errors. Oh no, some no? engineers are very good. Uh, right. Most engineers are very good that, that I deal with, and uh, they would. Well uh, said, well said. And they would uh, design their circuits. Uh, there would be a few minor issues here and there that mm -hmm. get picked up. Yep. And a lot of them aren't very obvious until you get into laying out the boards. Of course. Yep. Right. And uh, you pick them up for them, and yep. most engineers are very grateful. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, then uh, you go ahead and uh, the engineers would supply the circuits to me, uh, they'll specify some special conditions, right. give me a mechanical uh, uh, requirements. As in the footprint layout of the board, maybe pl some placement information? Yeah, exactly, connectors right. and, and some critical things. Yep. Uh, the schematics generally would, uh, would include most footprints. Okay. In some cases you might have uh, alternative footprints that you might consider. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it'd be all left up to me, and I'd lock myself up and uh, <laughs> for a, get onto it. And, uh, how how long, basically, for an expert layout guy to do that board a there? A for design example. like this, at the time, I had to do some research on DDR3, make sure that I cover all Got the it. requirements, yep. uh, and a research on a few other minor issues here mm -hmm. and there. And I believe this board took uh, in excess of about 200 hours. About 200 hours? Yes. Yep. 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 That's but what I'd uh, expect. Yep. And it was a 12 layer board. I believe it could have maybe reduced the layer count, but the customer wasn't at the phase because uh, it was in large volume. Yep. And because he wanted it in a hurry. So. Uh, exactly. Yeah. You don't want to be mucking around yeah, trying to fit on exactly, eight. Exactly. You know. And yep. take too many risks. Do you prefer people who really add design notes to the schematics and stuff like that? Is that beneficial? And who actually put bypass caps where they want them on the schematic, not just have a whole page of bypass caps? <laughs> yeah, once upon a time when you're talking about bypass caps, that might be in the case. But with time, I've worked out exactly where they, where they belong and where they should be. Yeah. But there are certain things like, for instance, if you've got a in-series resistor with a, the two, between two devices, obviously, if they need to be closer to one device than the other. As, as a, for a series yeah. termination resistor, yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously, it'd be nice to put them closer to the device that they should be physically close to on the board. On the schematic and have a little note yes, bubble on there exactly. that tells you. Even if yep. there's no note, uh, I would put it closer to the device that is on the schematic. But then right. sometimes I find, I oh, know it's done the wrong way. So then right. I would... Uh, Sort of without it making a big deal about it, I'd, I'd actually move the train resistor to the other page, closer to the device it belongs to. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Tweak the schematic yeah, exactly. just a little bit, exactly. right? So it's a you can still make a decent living just doing PCB layout, oh, yes. or, or is it getting harder and harder? It's getting more difficult as time happens. As time uh, why happens why is that? Is because they get more in-house talent for PCB design, or what's the what's the reason? Well, uh, it's getting more difficult from perspective that uh, uh, unfortunately a lot of uh, companies and organisations seem to 
uh, require and expect their engineers to lay out boards. Uh, right, that's common. Yeah, and that's becoming more and more common. Yep. And uh, the poor engineers, half the time, are scratching their head there, <laughs> trying to work out what they need to do. Uh, engineers do a reasonably good job. They're capable people, right? But they're not necessarily experienced. They're not expert layout yeah, guys. Exactly. Yeah, so exactly. So they've got a lot of big learning curve, and by the time they get yeah. there, uh, they really waste a lot of resources. And uh, I find most of my good customers uh, to be, tend to be customers that have sort of learned how long through that process mm -hmm. and realise that they could get a board design that will cost less to manufacture, yep. less is issues in manufacturing, uh, and all, all around a much more uh, quicker and successful product. Got it. So do you do you ever get high, like PCB designs you've got to fix up? Like the they had the designer try attempt to do a board and it was just so bad that they just throw threw their arms up in the air. Yeah, that happens regularly, but it's uh, but I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't really put it that way. What I right. tend to find is uh, the customers don't really inform you totally. They just right. say we need a redesign, and then you slowly work out why. Why? Yeah. And quite often, uh, I would convince uh, that uh, instead of modifying or something, yep. I would convince the customer that we could uh, potentially save a lot of money, go from 12 layers to eight layers. Mm -hmm. because 12 layers weren't really necessary, yep. uh, potentially, and uh, once when they realise, uh, they might think, oh, this is going to be an expensive process, but mm -hmm. if they do their sums, they realise that the cost of a uh, lower count board, especially if it's going low volume, will more than pay for itself Got in it. a year or two. Yep. And so once when uh, management and people in those areas realise this, they jump at the opportunities. Thanks, Chris. Okay, thank you. I'm at the Worth Electronics stand and I noticed a book, oh, a trilogy of magnetics, look at this. Design guide for EMI filter, switch on power supplies and RF circuits. Wow. Let's have a squiz at this. Oh, CD. We've got, uh, sorry, you can't see everything. Layout considerations. Oh, application circuits. Nice. Yep. It's all in there. Wow, this looks jazzy. I want one of these. Wonder if they're giving them away. That'd be a nice freebie at the stand. Wow. Woo, sensor interface with ESD protection. Wow, that looks beefy. Wow, input protection there. All sorts of stuff. Oh, I want one. I'm here with Ruben. Hello. And he's going to tell us about the book. The Trilogy of Magnetics, it's our fourth edition. Yep. Um, it's a three chapter book, hence the trilogy. Um, the, the main idea is we teach people about switch mode power supplies and EMC. Um, chapter one's basic principles up to very advanced theory and understanding. Mm -hmm. Chapter two, components, we talk about things like skin effect and the relationship between ferrite and copper. And, and more than half the book is applications that are EMC uh, compliant, that are reference designs from all the IC guys that we do work with. It's an in-house book that we've done. This is our head of product management, Alexander Gerfer, um, and Thomas Brander is our transformer specialist. Uh, and these are some external consultants that are very, uh, uh, how can I say, experienced within the European market within EMC that, that are external consultants that helped us write, write the book. So, yep. Got it. And what are the other books in the series? Um, so we've got three other books. We have the LT Spice uh, Simulator book, which is a, a fantastic book so that you can... Is that um, a how-to? It is a design guide, it's right. sort of a dummies dummies guide to LT Spice, Spice. Fantastic. from very basic up to very advanced uh, understanding around here and yep. it really helps you make your own models in, in LT Spice. Got it. Okay. So this, this Chan model, this seven parameters that you need, we really give you the knowledge on how to make your own models up. Fantastic. Um, and the brand new one is the ABC of capacitors. Oh, so excellent! Worth recently coming to the yep. capacitor market. We're we're really doing quite well in that area at the moment. Um, and this is a, a new foray, just a little skinny book, but yep. uh, very nice in terms of longevity, uh, deratings, uh, things like this. We talk about polymer and uh, the new technologies there. Got it. Um, the other book is the trilogy of connectors. Hang on, that's four. Oh no, the ABC is not one of the trilogy. It's not a trilogy, right. but it's, um, the, the actual, the trilogy of magnetics used to be called the ABC of magnetics, so Got it. once this gets bigger, she'll graduate to a trilogy book, okay? <laughs> uh, the connectors, uh, this is a more a production orientated book, so the guys that are doing operations mm -hmm. and production within your company, um, we, we really talk about the do's and don'ts on how to manufacture yep. connectors and crimping, gold plating, corrosion, uh, where to place the best type of connectors in your application. 
and how much does it cost? Okay, for the set. so start Pick from, you buy it as a set? Uh, you can buy it as a set, and we'll probably give you a nice little discount. Um, Excellent. But this one and the LT Spice book, uh, we sell these for 60 US dollars mm -hmm. worldwide, um, or 50 euros, depending on, on where your market is. Uh, this one is a $30 book, and this one we're selling for $10, but, awesome. um, you know, usually if you uh, are a good customer of ours, we might even give you this one for free. So. Fantastic, Ruben. Thanks, mate. No worries. Yeah, I tell you what, I don't mind this uh, component selection wheel here. Look at this. Around the outside, we've got uh, all the different uh, types of, you know, worth actually supply these things. So, the different types. So, we've got 1206 WB, I assume that's a series. And then it's got all uh, downsizing recommendations and everything. So, the specs, you just rotate that around. And that's pretty terrific. Attenuation is a function of system impedance. Nice. People don't do enough, uh, you know, of these um, wheels and things. These used to be very, oh, oh, have a look at the back. Chip bead selector. Terrific. Look at that. Impedance at 100 megahertz. There you go. So you just rotate it around and you get all the data out of that. That one's for, yep, once again, for chip bead inductors. Fantastic. Ah, oh, need more of those. You know, I'm here at the Mona Sam with John South. Say hi, John. Hi. <laughs> and we're just going to have a look at the size comparison between the 1000 Z and the 4000 here, which I'm, yeah, can we like stick it in front or something? Mate? There we go, stick it on top. Fantastic. That's the way. Look at that, that's a huge difference. The 4000 is, the MSO 4000 is actually a really quite a large scope, but you get the full four channels of, well, this one's four channel, but it's only got the single um, uh, adjustment, vertical adjustment for it that's common across all four channels. This has, you know, four totally separate uh, channels like that. And they, they've almost lined them up. It's a shame they couldn't put the external trigger over here and physically line them up like that. But they, hey, they've got this little colored marker going across here. So that's pretty jazzy, I like that. Very nice. Anyway, I showed that in a uh, recent um, one with the LaCroix uh, Wavejet, and I had to Photoshop this in, one in because I didn't have one. There you go. You can see the whole size. And there's the 6000 next to it. That's a more shorty, shorter squat one. Once again, sharing the vertical channels there. Awesome. Just wanted to show you that. Thanks, John. No worries. All right. What I've got here is uh, Siglent Function Gen hooked up to an SDS uh, 2000. I was hoping to get the new X series uh, Siglent, but uh, unfortunately they couldn't get it in time. And I set up a, uh, a one megahertz uh, carrier with a one kilohertz 100% modulated um, sine wave as my standard uh, test signal that I use for uh, intensity graded displays. And as you can see, it does intensity graded. Okay, this is an, you know, it's super phosphor oscilloscope, right? So you can actually see that it is intensity graded. You can see the increased intensity in there, hopefully. So let's uh, get the screen. But anyway, I haven't, uh, I don't think I've shown this Siglent 2000 on the blog before. So I just wanted to show you. So it does have the variable intensity, but it doesn't cut the mustard right up at the full I don't know, like, that's a trigger thing. Um, all, basically every scope I've ever tried has trouble triggering uh, on this thing. It's not the easiest thing to trigger on. So that's an interesting effect that they got there. But uh, yeah, it does not have the variable intensity. It's not showing it on that 100% modulated one like we get on the Rigol and the Agilent. Bummer. And I'm here with Jackie, and he's gonna show us this thing it's a uh, flatbed RF scanner, and look at this. We can actually put our board in, explain away. I'll show you a real fancy result. Yeah. You can show, you can see there's where the radiation come from. So it does a full 3D map. Yes, you are right. How does it do the 3D map? It's just an overlay of the picture of the PCB yep. and the test result. Got it. So by doing so, you see the still checkbox. If yep. I check it away, you got it. And one. so we can see where our RF hotspots. Yep. Can you set the bandwidth, the resolution bandwidth filter, and the whole? You are right. You can do the yep. setting. For example, this small icon, you click it, bang, it gives you got start it. frequencies, stop, stop frequency, frequency yep. reference level, yep. resolution bandwidth. 
So the wider bandwidth you set, the yep. faster speed you get. Got it. That's and just like a spectrum analyzer. It's right. You have 1,218 1, small dipole antennas. Oh, on the got surface. it. So it's got a thousand antennas. It's, 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 it's got 1,200 antennas, yeah, so and the then you can switch control, those. Yeah, the phrase of all of them. It switches them in, right. So how long does it take to scan one board given that it has to switch through all and test all uh, 1200 well, it depends sensors? Well, what's the bandwidth, what's yep. the resolution bandwidth you want to achieve. Right, so, but you know, for our current settings, how long would that? Okay, um, give me one second. Yep. Let's have a fifth try. You see the button scan. Yep. Let's start to count. Yep. Start. You see here? Oh, and it scans. Oh, that's, that's pretty quick. Yep. That's scanning in large blocks though. Yes, you're right. It's come by step by step. Right. Ten. Yeah, but it's in seconds. Right. That's pretty quick. Yeah. But it scanned them in large blocks and not a thousand. Oh, oh sorry. Yes. Well, that's yes, sorry. because I set the probes. <laughs> I can show oh, you okay. all the probes. Oh, you can I stack set. the probe. You yeah. can you can combine the probes. Then I show you. This is a probe area. Oh, okay. Oh, this is a got probe it. Area. So if Very I select nice. all of them, okay. Let me do one thing. Select none of them. Yep. And I remove the overlay. I use my mouse, I mm -hmm. click and drag, and this is area I set. Got it. And I select yep. it. So it will only scan this it's scan area. in those cells, yeah. So the smaller the area you set, the faster speed you get. Got it. Yep, that's it, how it works. Mm -hmm. And this is from a company called M-Scan. M-Scan is a Canadian company who make the uh, EM Expert and yep. IF Expert. And so the EM Expert is for big compliance PCB scanning, IF Expert is for the antenna testing. And how much we looking at here? So Mark, who asked me that question? Don't ask, ask the price. Mark. Mark, come on, tell us the price, son. Um, around $100,000 depends on um, whether you want the one we've got on uh, display here, which has the embedded spectrum analyzer. Right. Uh, less if you want the scanner and you use your own spectrum analyzer. So that got obviously it. has flexibility and takes some cost out of it. Got it. But it's almost here. If you have to ask the question, you can't afford it kind of range. It's, yeah. it's, it's really for if you're doing a lot of production runs or board designs, that's yep. obviously going to come into its own right. Yep. If you're going to do two board runs a year, then obviously it's not going to be cost effective. However, Got we do have it available for rent as well, so customers might be interested in that. Fantastic. All right, thanks, guys. I'd love to do a teardown and see the 1200 dipole antennas inside that thing. <laughs> That'd be fantastic. Can we tear down a hundred thousand dollar bit of kit? <laughs> Let me think of that for a nanosecond. No. <laughs> no. Oh, sorry, folks. All right, I'm checking out the Flea FPGA Uno, and I've got the designer who's a bit shy. He doesn't want to be on camera. I've got Val. Come on, tell us about it, Val. Tell yeah, us all sure, about this. Dave, no worries. Yep. Um, yeah, look, it's just a little uh, board that I've knocked up uh, sort of on my, uh, my, my spare time and basically it's a look, Arduino compatible, R3 compatible yep. uh, board, um, uh, FPGA based. Uh, what run, FPGA? Tell us about the Lattice FPGA. This is Mark F XO2 uh, low power FPGA. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, got 7,000 uh, uh, lookup table yep. elements in it and uh, has about 26k of block RAM. It's also got uh, 512k of uh, static RAM externally. Static, not dynamic. You've got not the static. Dynamic, correct. Uh, and it's yeah. very easy it's to, very easy in to use FP, in a VHDL or, or Rarolock, whatever. So, so it's very easy, to, uh, you know, very straightforward yep. from that perspective. Also has uh, digital video out. It's got USB. Yep. Got, um, it's got obviously that's USB host, and you've got uh, obviously a USB slave and serial there. You've also got uh, composite video and oh, audio. Oh, composite is composite video and audio. Absolutely oh, one correct. of those four pin. Yes. Oh, I hate those. Well, well. <laughs> you know. Oh yeah, no, it's Raspberry sort of like yeah, similar to the Raspberry Pi sort right, of uh, yeah, thing. Yeah. But yeah, got it. you've got uh, six analog inputs, which are uh, Sigma D uh, Delta. You, that's, oh. that's all. That's, that's new. How many bits? Sixteen bits. Oh well, out there. Variable, all variable. It's all in the FPGA. It's all in the FPGA. PGA, correct, of course. Correct. But you can go, it essentially can go up to about 225 megahertz single bit. If we were to go to maximum sample rate, it's one yep. bit, uh, one bit uh, accuracy or one bit resolution at 225 megahertz, and then you can scale that down in Got orders it. of two, of course. Got so it. now on the other and on the underside, we underside. have Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi module. Yay. Yay! All certified and approved because you buy the off-the-shelf module. Correct. Yes. Excellent. All, uh, yeah, all sort of above board yep. and all very, 
Yeah, anyway, that's, that's, is, so that's the... Is anybody else doing an FPGA one like this? There are there are a couple of other, um, uh, uh, well, say, a couple of other offerings that are sort of out and about yep. now. Um, and some of those ex actually exist on Hackaday. There are sort of a homebrew right. efforts that are going on in Hackaday. Mm -hmm. uh, Andy Lukitz, he's got his own zinc-based uh, yeah, uh, Xilinx, yep. uh, zinc-based uh, FPGA. Yep. And, uh, Did you think about basis. using the hard core with the zinc with the ARM processor in it? I, or? Did. I thought it was overly complex for, overly an, complex? for, an, entry, for an entry level board. I thought right. that it was probably like, I mean, I mean we, we can put it, you know, we can put an AVR, we can put a we can, core, yep. we can put, a, yep. put ARM, I mean, like uh, ARM compatible, yep. right? Yep. Etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, including and I even have my own homebrew 32-bit uh, software that can go in there as well. It's very minimal, it. and very minimalistic, very easy, to, very easy to follow, very easy to use, implement. So that's the, so that's the, well, that's, the, that's the whole deal there. That is the key with this, though, with anything FPGA-based like this. How easy is it for the beginner to get it out of the box and hook it up and get a soft core running? We're really glad, going. really glad you asked that. that you made that point, Dave, because uh, we've been thinking about that, and the, the answer, the answer to that was. Well, first of all, we've got a we've got a MIPS-based uh, solution for this guy, right? Or, or, yep. you know, MIPS-compatible, sorry, I should be saying. Um, <laughs> uh, MIPS-compatable, MIPS but uh, it's also RISC-V, so there's, 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 two, there's several, several options there, and they both work out of the box in the Arduino environment. Right. So you can you basically you you, you know you load you install your Arduino IDE, mm -hmm. you install your plug-in, and you roll with it. You pretty Got much it. just use it like a regular Arduino. So that's that's the well, obviously regular Arduino that has happens to also have you <laughs> yep. know, uh, digital video out and <laughs> USB host. Well, potentially that's still something that's in the works that we're still working Got on it. developing on that. But anyway, yeah. So there, that's fantastic. Uh, that's where we're at. So do we have a baseline price for this yet? We are aiming at around about fifty dollars US. Yep. Typically. Um, but we're sort of yeah. That's still right. That's still we're still working on that one. That's still working. And progress. you're ready to go on production, I hear. Yes, that's ready correct. Ready to roll. Yeah, yeah absolutely, cool. absolutely. Excellent. And if people want one, where can they go? Well, they can. Uh, they can go to flee. FleeSystems.com, which is Flea the, system. oh, was it on the top side? It was FleeSystems.com. Yep. I love the name. Yep. So they can just uh, shoot Fantastic. us an email, and uh, if they want to register their interest, um, yep, they're more than welcome to do that. I love it. Thank you. He just randomly walked up to me on the yeah, electronics here and said, "Hey, you want to check this out?" Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Val. I've got to ask about the bodge yes, now. Yes. Tell yes. us about the bodge. Okay. The bodge actually has an interesting story to it. Um, do we, tell. Yes. Yes. That's actually um, uh, that's that's a coupling capacitor for the five volt auxiliary line that's feeding in from the HD, from the uh, digital video uh, connector. Right. I didn't have a coupling capacitor there before, and that's really <laughs> bad news if you if you uh, obviously want to keep your signal integrity intact. Right. Okay? And so hence I had to put one in. Okay. And uh, that's uh, thankfully the new boards that are coming in yep. will have that. Uh, they'll all they'll be, be They'll be all good. Fantastic. Good work, Val. No worries. And that's Val. He was too nervous to be on camera, but <laughs> that's all right. So you just heard his voice, but there he is with his board. Awesome. Look at the smile. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm here with Alex, and he's going to show us a prototype pick and place machine. And this is a PCB uh, yes, milled we, out. Yep, milled out on an LPKF yep. S63. Yep. Which okay. we've got. Have we got one here? Yes. Yep. There we go. There it's we go. The it's just yep. been milled out right there. Okay. So this is the machine that yep. actually milled out. This board? Yep, so this is a complete in house prototyping solution from doing the, uh, from actually doing the PCB, yes. milling it out, okay. to pick so and place. You'll notice that this is quite an unusual looking pick and place machine because it's a prototype unit, not a production unit. Aha, we've got ourselves a stenciler. So we've got our, yep. yes, our stencil printer. Yep. Okay, so we will place our prototype board. And that's just a mylar uh, stencil, this is it? A, yes, which has right. been which Cheap. has been which has been actually uh, printed using the S63. Uh, right, it's a polyamide okay. stencil. Yep, actually made from polyamide. Yeah, that's all right. Polyamide. So what do we need is to actually apply our solder now. Yep. Let's go. Okay, and let's squidgy it. Let's squidgy it. Okay. All right, we got our. I've got our board board all pasted up. And ready to go. There it is. Is that board? Yep. And it's got our paste on there. Nice. All right. Okay. 
So we can whack it in our... As I said, this is a prototype pick and place machine. Uh, it does have automatic uh, feeders across here, but it's um, but they're reasonably expensive as all automatic feeders are. It's cheaper to get these manual ones, but it can auto, auto uh, ratchet those and actually um, essentially feed them, like automatic feed them, but they're not unreal, so you can get them from your regular cut tape. And uh, the head is up under there, like that, and it will do uh, solder paste dispensing as well as um, glue dispensing as well. So it can actually uh, stick down the glue to hold the components and, well, <laughs> hey, there we go, all right. And that's a um, the bottom camera down there. It has a top camera as well. And um, yeah, can we see it go? Here we go. Okay, so let's... Now normally, uh, yeah. if, if fiducials are available on the board, yep. the machine will automatically detect the fiducials Got it. and start. In, the, in this particular case, the board does not have fiducials. Right. So, but I do have the option to manually nominate fiducials. And, and two, there we course. go. Yep, two. of course. Yeah. One is pretty useless. So I did the second one. Yep, there we go. And there's a, the, there are the heads over there. All the individual nozzles. There we go. Checks the component and then drops it. It picked it up from manual feeder. It checks that it's on there and then goes and drops it. That's pretty quick. That is, uh, whoa, yeah, that's for a heavy. Oh, that was only a light component. I assume it's got variable speed depending on the weight of the component and everything else. It's yep. something which you can actually program yep. into the machine. You can program it in, yep. So, so with that very bright bottom camera there that switches on, it's just checking that the component is actually on there and it's the correct orientation. And, uh, whoo, that's blinding actually. So the, uh, the machine, yep. the, sorry, the bottom camera will also calculate the offset so it recognizes the shape. Mm -hmm. It finds the middle yep. and compares to to the actual placement, so it, it will do a correction. It will do a correction. Yes. So even so if it don't came out to... of the tape yep. at a at a wrong angle, yep. at and a it wrong does. end, and it'll auto correct. Yeah, it will auto correct. Yes. Very good. That's a very nice prototype. Your system. What sort of dollars are we talking about without the manual, without the automatic feeders? The, the Rough. machines. The, mach the, the, the machines. The entry machine is only the manual. The manual. The yep. machine itself yep. starts at about nineteen thousand. Nineteen. Yep. Uh, and then it depends how many feeders you put on it. Yep. Uh, with the manual feeders, you're probably talking a machine around. 22,000. Is that Australian or US? Australian. Australian, Australian okay. This is Australian dollars. <laughs> right. Yes. Okay, so in US it's a fair bit cheaper yeah. because of our four yes. dollar. The particular yep. machine here with the, uh, a good number of <laughs> automatic feeders and yep. a mixture of the manual ones, you're probably talking over the 40,000. Oh, 40, sure, 000. because the, autom yeah, the this, automatic feeders this cost a, a lot. This, this, yep. this can actually go yep. into small production as well. So you can do small production runs, but Very it's primarily, primarily a prototype. Yes. Yes. System. Yes. Yep. It is a and system. what uh, component sizes can we go down? Uh, we to? can go from 0201. 0201. Yes. As a standard. Uh, we can, yeah, we can do that. Yes, we can. Uh, yep. We can uh, do the, the FPGAs, yep. uh, QFNs, DFNs, the LEDs. Yep. Uh, down to 0.4 millimeter. 0.4 millimeter pitch. And it's got uh, point, and it's got uh, so solder paste dispenser and. It, 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 it has can. a dispensing head. It, yep, and so that, that liquid is a, yeah, that's a purge liquid to actually uh, wipe the nozzles and actually clean it them, actually flush them out. It cleans the channel, Yep. because this is where our solder will come out of, right. solder yep. paste. So we need to clean this channel when we're yep. finished. So uh, this is this is now cleaning it, and then when we put the solder on, we need to yep. prime it until the solder comes out, and then we can start. And it can also, not only dispense solder paste, but also glue. Glue as well. So you can get glue. And our board's finished. Ta da! There it is! It's done! Awesome! There it is! There it is. Very nicely. And we're gonna put it in our. And we can put it in our thermal oven and. Yep. Yep. Done! Okay. Fantastic! Thank you very much, Alex. Oh, hey, there we go. He's gonna. He is gonna. Geez, you do have a full uh, yes. system here. We do end to end for our <laughs> solution. And you've got it all set up on the stand, working. Fantastic. Done, and our board will bake, and it'll be ready to eat. <laughs> be ready in about four minutes. <laughs> Thanks, guys, and that's from uh, Embedded Logic Solutions. Oh, what was the brand of this puppy? 
This, this is Mechatronic Systems. German manufacturer. Uh, German? Yep. Yep. Excellent. All right. Thanks, guys. That is the Thank P30. You. The P30. Yes. And we've got a UAV here. This is from uh, the Monash University. And uh, this was in the Outback Challenge. Is that right? That's the one. And there we go. And we've got uh, some lightweight uh, composites, Kevlar. Uh, yep. That's fiberglass. Yeah, fiberglass. Uh, Kevlar yep. would be around here. Yep. In the joints. And uh, carbon fiber is in the spar for the wings. Got it. And yeah, it's mostly fiberglass and wood. And you compare and what did you have to do in the Outback Challenge? Uh, basically our mission was to find Outback Joe who was a dummy that had a right. yellow hat on top. So we used color coordination to co find uh, the yellow hat. Um, unfortunately we didn't find it, but we right. managed to do what it had to do. So it observed what it could find and since it couldn't find anything, it just went back and safely landed. So. Got it. And you didn't crash once? Yep, we didn't crash <laughs> once. That's, that's the main So, thing. if this thing crashed, would it survive or um, would it be totaled? Uh, <laughs> that depends on the height, right? It, because it's just fiberglass. Yeah. When, right. As soon as it uh, cracks and breaks, you can just put another layer on top. Got it. It increased yep. the weight by a bit, but it's, it's virtually nothing. So. Got it. And how much does this weigh? All uh, up? You, around five to six kilos. About five to six kilos, that's not much. That's, yeah, that's nice we're work. We're going to definitely reduce the weight next time and yep. we're going to have a, a much smaller aircraft as well because the next challenge is going to have a, a VTOL aircraft instead. Right. And we have different ideas for that, but the main one is having a tilt rotor. Yep. So it would have uh, the, t uh, the rotors pointing upwards mm -hmm. and then as soon as it has vertical takeoff, it'll slowly transition and push the, uh, the UAV towards cruise speed and then have them at 90 degrees where they, it can go at full, like at cruise throttle and then Got fly. it. So this is just part of an engineering, the engineering school? Yep. It's uh, for UAS. UAS started off as a FYP group. And then um, most people in aerospace have a hobby and, uh, and it's kind of like a fanatic kind of thing. Yep. So eventually we ended up being part of the uh, Outback Challenge and we just look forward to like getting first place in that. So that's our goal next year. Awesome. Good luck. Thank Thanks. You. There's still half an hour left in the show and they're packing up. <laughs> Everyone's here, yeah, it starts to wind down, nobody, uh, basically nobody uh, turns up at, uh, you know, 4.30 or oh, they just had a, uh, just had a fan walk in and said he just, uh, he just turned up and he, yeah, it's just like he's not going to get be able to see much, yeah, they're packing up, they, they're gone, they're smart, and uh, yep, so very few people left. CK's had enough. He's gone. He wants to go home. <laughs> so that's it. It's all done and dusted. I'm not going to stick around and get uh, you know time lapse um, pack up footage. I've done that in previous shows. I'm going to wander back to the hotel room. I have to wander back because the bloody trams are on strike here in Melbourne. So there you go. Anyway. It's a good day for a walk. Catch you next time. No! No! <laughs> and no one's keener to get out of here than John. <laughs> See you, mate.